Welcome back to another episode of the Rational Football League Show. My name is Emmett Sward. I am here, as always, with my co-host, Brendan Ford. What's up, y'all? You guys can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. Come check us out on all our platforms. Talk, come talk to us. We love hearing from you guys. We love the video suggestions. With that, we are going to get right into our segments. Today, we're covering some fun ones. We're going to be looking at who the Packers should take in the draft, the surprise player for them. We're also going to be discussing if the Jets should take a receiver with their top pick. And finally, we're going to be looking at is Brian Thomas Jr. overhyped? We'll see you guys in that first segment. Who is the game changer the Packers need to secure in this year's draft? The Packers squeaked their way into the playoffs last season going 9-8 and eight and getting it as a wildcard team. As I'm sure you know, they would then go on to put the league on notice by blowing out the two-seeded Dallas Cowboys at home, sending Dak Prescott and former Packers head coach Mike McCarthy off to another disappointing offseason. The Pack followed up that performance by taking the eventual NFC champion 49ers down to the last drive. The Packers have a chance to build on that great season in 2024, but it all starts with nailing this draft. The Green Bay Packers, despite their success last season, still have some glaring holes if they want to take the next step. One major area of concern you should have is pass protection. The Packers lost their starting left guard, John Runyon, and are hoping for growth from center Josh Myers and right guard, Sean Ryan. The Packers defense was also terrible against the run last season. They gave up 128.3 yards per game, which was good for 28th in the league. So I would expect them to, work, to look for upgrades at defensive tackle and linebacker. In case you missed it, the Packers have already made an upgrade at safety by adding Xavier McKinney and have replaced Aaron Jones with Josh Jacobs. So I would be surprised to see them go after these positions for anything other than depth. So we could be like a lot of other channels and analysts that sit here and tell you the Packers should take Cooper DeJean in the first round. Nothing against Cooper. He is a great corner and the Packers have a strong history of drafting defensive players from Iowa. But that is not why you come to this channel. You come here because we like to take the extra step. So we won't be talking about Cooper in this video. In fact, we aren't even gonna talk about the first round. You are a great fan and you probably already have looked up every name that's been linked to the Packers at 25. So in keeping with the Packers tradition of taking overlooked players and turn them into household names, we are only gonna be talking about a day three guy. Today, the player we are gonna cover is Christian Boyd, a defensive tackle out of Northern Iowa. If you haven't heard of him, don't worry, you are not alone. He comes from a small school and hasn't received much attention from the national media. So before we tell you why he is the missing piece of the Packers defense, let me tell you a little bit about him. The 6'3", 317 pound Boyd was a three-star prospect at a Blue Springs High School in Missouri before he chose Northern Iowa over Arkansas State, Kansas, and UCF. As pro day, he put up 38 reps on the bench press, which would have been the second most if he was actually even invited to the combine. The important point you need to know about Boyd is that he has incredible power. His go-to move is the bull rush. He plays with strong hands and can drive guards back into quarterback's laps. He can work off this with a beautiful bull and pull move that he displayed at the Shrine Bowl. Also, when you turn on the tape, he is getting off the line at the same speed as the defensive ends. Now here's how he is the missing piece for the Packers defense. If you were a Packers fan, I'm sure you noticed by now, but the Packers fired defensive coordinator Joe Barry. You most likely even celebrated with a couple of cases of spotted cow when the news broke. But here's what you might not have realized with the firing of Joe Barry and the hiring of Jeff Halfley. Halfley's bringing a 4-3 defense with him, which is a change from a 3-4 defense the Packers have been running since 2009. If you are thinking, hell, does both equal 7, so who cares? You are not technically wrong, and this is the best kind of not wrong to be. Essentially, the difference is the responsibilities of the D-line. In the 3-4 defense, the line is expected to play in a two-gap technique to free up the middle backers. Pretty much that means the line's first job is to occupy bodies, and then their second job is to play the ball. In a 4-3 defense, the line has gap responsibility. This means they are assigned to a gap and have to preserve that gap. 
So with the Packers switching to a 4-3 defense, they will need to bring in guys that fit that system best. Slayton and Wyatt have just not been getting the job done so far, posting PFF grades of 62.3 and 59.6 last season, respectively. While both may benefit greatly from the switch, it will be best to bring in someone who excels against the run and the pass and can fit the requirement. Not only did Boyd have the third most hurries in this draft class and the third best win percentage on pass plays, but he was also one of the best run stuffers. He received the 83.9 grade from PFF, which is the eighth highest out of all eligible defensive interior prospects who played 200 snaps. Adding Christian Boyd would improve a run defense that gave up over 110 yards per game in the playoff. If the Packers wanted to get past the teams like the Niners and the Lions, they will need to be able to stop the run. But tell us what you think about Christian Boyd. If you like this video, then you'll like other videos we have on the channel. Thank you so much for watching. We're the RFL Show, and we'll be seeing you in the next video. Guys, hopefully you enjoyed that Packers segment. Again, we think Christian Boyd would be a steal for the Packers in the fourth round. With that, we're going to be turning our attention over to our next segment. What should the Jets do with their first pick? I don't think taking a receiver would be the best option for them. But we'll explain why in that segment. Should the Jets really use their top draft pick on a wide receiver? If you clicked on this video, I am sure you know the Jets have some glaring needs on the roster. And at the top of the draft is their best shot to add a potential superstar at a thrift store price. But does adding a receiver really put this team over the top? The Jets are coming off a disappointing season where they had sky high expectations with the addition of Aaron Rodgers. Unfortunately, that only lasted a few minutes into the first game. If you are being cautiously optimistic for this upcoming season, honestly, I won't blame you. I will say the Jets did make some solid additions this year to fix problems they had going into last season. The biggest moves were the addition of Tyron Smith and Morgan Moses to play left and right tackle, respectively. The Jets also picked up Mike Williams from the Chargers to improve their receiving room and traded for Hassan Riddick from the Eagles to replace defensive end Bryce Huff. Even with those additions, there are still some holes the Jets should patch up. The Jets still need to find upgrades at left guard, tight end, and possibly safety. I would also expect them to bring in a receiver, but not with their first pick. You're probably saying, why would they not take a receiver at 10 then, but with like a thicker New Jersey accent that I couldn't really do? The obvious answer is that the top three receivers won't be on the board by the time the Jets are on the clock. There are too many teams in the top nine that need a receiver, and the only way any of them fall to 10 is in a PFF draft simulator with all the settings turned down. Also, this is an extremely deep receiver class. The Jets could land a good receiver in any of the first four rounds, so it wouldn't be the best use of assets to take a second tier receiver at 10. Another reason the Jets shouldn't take a receiver at 10 is that they already addressed the position in free agency with the addition of Mike Williams. You could also apply this to the Jets needing to take a right or left tackle. Tyron Smith and Morgan Moses are already penciled in as starters for the Jets. They are both around 33 and can still play another two or three years at a high level. I know what you're probably thinking right now. Tyron Smith is always injured, and I get it, but this is not only a deep receiver class, it is also a deep tackle class. There are quality tackles the Jets could take on day two that would be able to step in right away if Tyron goes down or Morgan Moses struggles. So, if we don't think the Jets should take a receiver, and we don't think they should take a tackle, then who should they take? Well, the answer is obvious. The Jets should take Brock Bowers. Don't believe me? Let us show you. Drafting a tight end is great because they can act as your left tackle and as your wide receiver one, filling two holes for price of one cheap player. Tight ends also make far less money than receivers. The top paid receiver is Tyreek Hill, who makes $30 million a year on average. The top tight end is Darren Waller, who comes in at $17 million a year on average. That is $13 million used on other players. Let's take a quick look at the four teams that made it to the conference championship. The Chiefs, Niners, Ravens, and Lions are all built in very different ways, but all have one position of strength in common. They all have superstar tight ends. The 49ers have Kittle, the Chiefs have Kelsey, the Lions have Sam Laporta, and the Ravens have Mark Andrews. In fact, seven of the top 10 leaders in tight end receiving yards made the playoffs. 
and two of the three that didn't were in the playoff race until the last few weeks. But could an argument be made to take a receiver at 10 if one of the big three fall? Of course you could. It would be an exciting addition to an already good receiver room. Wilson and Odunze would be fun combination for years until you have to pay them both top 10 receiver money. However, it wouldn't move the needle on the Jets' Super Bowl aspirations. The best tight ends are matchup nightmares that really stress the defense, even if they are double covered. Bringing in a wide receiver or a tackle would be doubling down on a hole the Jets have already filled. Taking Bowers would give Aaron Rodgers the best tight end he has ever played with and would really open this offense up. He would take attention away from Garrett Wilson and could also seal edges for Bryce Hall. His cheaper position would also free up more money for the Jets in the future. Do you want another receiver? Draft Bowers. If you want to tackle, draft Bowers. He really is a one-size-fits-all player. But tell us who you would like the Jets to draft. Also, if you do want the Jets to draft Romo Dunze, but you're not sure what his weakness is, I recommend you check out our draft profile on him. You can find that video right here. All right, guys, hopefully you agree with us that the Jets should not go receiver or tackle and that Brock Bowers would be the best player for them. With that, we're going to be turning our attention to our final segment of the day it is a draft profile on Brian Thomas Jr. There's a lot of hype around this guy right now, but is it actually warranted? We'll break that down in the segment. Drafting Brian Thomas Jr. in the first round is the kind of move that would get a general manager fired within two years. There is some good in his film, but the bad sticks out like a sore thumb, and if a GM is willing to ignore it, they should be gone. From Daniel Jeremiah to Mel Kuyper to Lance Erline, there aren't many analysts that don't have the 6'4 Brian Thomas Jr. going somewhere in the first round. The consensus is that the speedy receiver will go somewhere around pick 17. Thomas is widely considered the next best receiver after the big three of Marvin Harrison Jr., Romo Dunze, and his LSU teammate Malik Napers. So if all of these guys think that Thomas is worthy of a first round pick, why is a small channel like us disagreeing with them? Well, the answer is simple. We are seeing something those analysts are overlooking. Before we start telling you all the bad with Brian Thomas Jr., let us extend an olive branch. We are going to spend the next few minutes talking about all the good within his game. Thomas Jr. is an extremely fast receiver. He posted a 4-3-3 40-yard dash at the combine, and it shows on his tape. Even when DBs were giving him a cushion, he was still able to blow by them. His speed shows up best on goal routes. According to Next Gen Stats, he reached a top speed of 22.91 miles per hour while running a go route. That's over one mile per hour faster than any other receiver. This guy is also a jump ball specialist, which probably comes from his basketball roots. He does a great job of timing his jump so he can always catch it at the highest point. According to PFF, he came down with over 50% of the contested balls that were thrown his way. Brian Thomas Jr. also practically lives in the end zone. He led the country with 17 touchdowns last season. He's a very smooth athlete who can get in and out of breaks easily. He also has a wide catch radius because of his larger frame and jumping ability. Lastly, he gives good effort when it comes to blocking for his teammates. Now that we've shown that we don't hate Thomas Jr. and that there is a lot of good within this game, let's get to why you are here. And what are we going to see that every other analyst is failing to see? First, Thomas seemed to have a really limited route tree at LSU. He mostly ran routes from the speedy receiver pack. These would be your hitches, shallows, comebacks, and go routes. Routes that don't normally require much nuance. The numbers also back up what we saw in the film. Thomas was targeted 18 times on medium routes or routes that were between 10 to 19 yards deep, compared to 22 targets on deep routes. Routes that were 20 plus yards and 43 targets on short routes, routes that were nine yards or less. For comparison, Malik Napers, a receiver in the same offense, had 34 medium targets, 29 deep targets, and 53 short targets. The fact that Thomas's medium routes are his least targeted depth backs up our claim that he was mostly asked to run simple short routes or deep routes, which require less getting in and out of breaks. But that wasn't the biggest factor that is making us disagree with the other analysts. To put it bluntly, he was clearly taking plays off when he knew he wasn't getting the ball. 
I know how that sounds, and I don't expect players to go 100% on every play. I had been there before where the play is a runaway, so you just negotiate with the corner to take the playoff. But there comes a point where your quarterback is scrambling and you're just standing there, not trying to work your way open or anything like that. Or on go routes where you can see he is clearly not running full speed. I get that you can use tempo to throw off a corner, but this play right here, he is just jogging. While this can be something that can be corrected, it shouldn't even be an issue in a guy that you are considering taking with a first round pick. Overall, to us, it would be a bad decision to take Brian Thomas Jr. in the first round. He has a lot of physical talent and potential, but his limited route tree and not giving great effort on every play should give any good GM a pause. To us, he would be a great pickup in the second round and would excel at a place with an established number one receiver. He does have the potential to be a top receiver on a team, but there is little guarantee that he will ever actually get there. All right, guys, that does conclude our episode for the day. Hopefully you enjoyed our Packers segment, Jet segment, and Brian Thomas Jr. segment. Uh, again, you guys can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And we actually did just get a Facebook as well, so come check us out over there. Uh, until next time, I've been Emmett. That's been B. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Thank you.